what we are trying to address is whole development of the student, understanding that they have academic things going on, they have conduct things going on, they have things happening in the res life. All of those elements are working together. And so we're not defining them just as this conduct case, which is one of the things that I think, um, again, when I work with schools, the reflection of the student at the center so that I can understand the context of what's happening with them as I'm doing conduct work just gives me so many more tools than I have this isolated picture of all I'm doing with the student is conduct and I have no idea what they're doing in any other area or how they're being connected with in our community, right? So I really like that as just a piece with our student at the center. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us for another episode of uh, Cap and Gown. I'm Rachel Phillips Buck, VP for Student Success. Matt Boisvert, uh, our president at Ferris, is joining me today. Hello. Hello. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Um, let's see. First of all, we're in November. Can you believe that? Why are you laughing? <laughs> My nose was itchy. Sorry. It is um, November. It's pretty hard to believe. Yeah, I was making plans for this month. And my friends that I was making plans with were like, hey, we can't do it this weekend, but we can do it next weekend. But next weekend is the weekend before Thanksgiving. I can't believe it's already here. Not wow. this weekend, but the next weekend is the weekend before Thanksgiving. So there you go. Um. Okay. I'm very excited about today because we are going to talk about a new model for um, student conduct. I mean, it's not new, but it's newer yeah. given. It's the, been around a little while. Yeah. Um, and I really love it. I think it just fits in so well to so many of the conversations that we've had before. So I'm very, very excited. Um, at our user conference a couple of years ago, I think in 2021, is that when we did our user conference? Um, we had some great, con is that, is that not right? I have no idea. Z, Z will have to tell us. Yeah. Okay. Maybe she can chat that to us. Um, but we had some really great conversations around this topic and just trying to figure out how we can, um, be consistent in our engagement with our students. So Michael Burns from Mary Harden Baylor, and I had some really good conversations about that. And this is just some more exploration. And then for some of you who maybe have never heard of the Epic Journey uh, model, it's going to be really uh, fun to talk about. So I want to dive into that, but I do have some State of the Union um, for us to discuss. <clears throat> what? I thought you I thought you had something else you wanted to talk about. What? Well, aren't you doing it? a deep dive on all the ways of note taking? Oh, yes, I forgot. Okay, you guys, I am trying to figure out a I don't know what's that called. It's not a strategy, but it's like a format for good note taking. So, I've been asking everybody that I know, how do you take notes? We have the Cornell Cornell method, which is what you teach a lot of times in school where it's like you have a title and then you have a skinny column and then you have your notes and then you have like your call out um, words, and then a summary at the end. Um, Shauna on our team wants a like task, like a coming out of a meeting, like task action items. I don't even know what it is. It's so specific or that's how her brain works. So she's like, I need all due of dates. Yeah. due dates. Yeah. I've been using the four buckets, which is where you divide the, the paper into four pieces and you have ideas, questions, assign tasks and personal to do's, but I got to play around with like the sizes of that. Right. Um, lots of good information about like using symbols, map, you use symbols and colors and note cards. Anyway, if you have a way that you take notes that you love, please share it with me. Uh, I would really like, this actually came out of our rocket books because I was thinking I would love to make a template on those rocket books, like with permanent markers so that I would have it all the time. Oh. But then I got really stressed out because I was like, it's permanent and it could be. Permanent. So I, I got to figure it out. Yeah. yeah. So note taking advice wanted, please. Okay. Well, here's my fun thing, Rachel, before we get into state of the union. Uh, this last week, we did a spark meeting with our friends at Juniata and uh, Dr. Matt Powell, who is a professor of geology. 
and is now currently in Egypt for a um, conference on global warming, I asked him, as I'm looking at his office, out of all of those books behind you, what would you recommend someone like me who doesn't know anything really about geology? What what book would you recommend that I read? Oh. And he recommended The Ends of the World. It is a study on all of the ways that that the world has had apocalypses. And um, so anyway, that's what he recommended. And so I bought it. And I just want to say, I don't know if anyone joining us has read that. And, and, and I haven't started it yet. I just got it. But also, if you have a book that you'd like to recommend, uh, chat it to us. Yeah. Um, you know that Kirk from Emmanuel is the one who told us about culture code, which has been such a cornerstone. Right. So I love that. I think right. that's a good idea. Okay. Can we move on to the State of the Union, please? What is the State of the Union? Well, so I have an article um, today about why so many colleges are resetting their tuition, which is pretty interesting. Yeah. I know that. So every campus is going to be a little bit different. It depends on <clears throat> where you are, what your market is, um, what your discount rate is, how many international students you have. There's a lot that goes into that conversation. Uh, this article is about a school that is in New Hampshire. It's a private college, Colby Sawyer College. They are cutting their tuition for the next academic year from $46,000 down to $17,000. So it's a drop of 60%, wow. which is pretty amazing. Um, they said the decision was made easier because of their 800 undergraduates, not a single person paid the sticker price. So right. they weren't having to like negotiate like, well, what's going to happen? We have some students who have are paying that. They're discounting it for all of them. Um, what's really interesting is Sally May just did a study that 81% of student respondents said they eliminated a college based on price before they even applied to it. So they had no knowledge of what they're actually going to pay after the discount rate. Do you have something to say about that? Well, I, I lived it. I mean, just with my son looking at schools and, and he was, you know, just looking first at price. Like, it's great that it's a prestigious school, but how much? Yeah. And so... That's so where I had to be of, like, you're yeah. not going to pay that. For a lot of families, though, if you don't know the ins and outs, you would look at that and say, that's totally untenable. There's no reason to apply. We can't yeah. manage that, yeah. right? What's interesting is um, in this article, they're talking about a study that was done on um, 30 institutions that reset their tuition between 2013 and 2018. So pandemic has made the impact of this reset of tuition a little bit different. But for this study of the 30 institutions that reset their tuition, on average, they saw a 9.6% increase in applications. They saw a 2.5% increase in first year enrollment, and they saw a 12% increase in transfer students the year of the reset. So yeah. pretty interesting. I think, um, you know, in the shifting sands of higher education, I think tuition pricing reset discount, all of that has to be on the table for some good discussions about what to do next, right? Yeah. Our our school and friends at Spring Hill College, that's they went through that process because yeah. they started to get that feedback and the students who they want to serve were not applying. Right. And so um, it's made a huge impact. It, I mean, there's a lot of like kind of shock internally that that you're making these cuts and what does that mean? And um, but then when it all, you start to see that it, it actually increases um, applications and your incoming class, it's not right. a bad move. Yeah, for sure. Okay. I have two articles that I, I just would recommend you guys find these articles because I cannot do them justice. Matt, you know, from our work over the years, one of my most favorite things is when we have a school that has a specialized population. So even if it's a high risk population or a high need population, it is so fun to become experts in a specific kind of student. Thinking about our friends at Centenary who are doing an yeah. awesome job with accessibility and accommodations. And so when we were there, they were like, yeah, everybody knows, like word on the street is if you want your student to be 
served well. And in these specialized programs, you want to send them to us because we do really, really well at it. So I love that. That's always yeah. exciting to me. These next two are about schools that have just picked populations to decide to serve really, really well. So one of them is about how can colleges better serve students with autism? Um, this is an interview with Sarah uh, Howarth, who is a faculty member at the University of Maine, but she piloted this program called Step Up to College, which was meant specifically for students who are on the spectrum to be able to come and experience college and decide if they want to pursue it. So she said, it's like a five week summer program. They come, they do all of the things that we would expect for you to do on a summer kind of bridge program, but then they've built in some of these things they call peers, uh, the peers program, where they talk about conversational skills, the basics of making friendships and getting along with your professors, how to trade information, how to enter and exit a conversation, how to find common interests with people, which is such great coaching. Like there are a lot of people with social anxiety who would really like to have that kind of coaching anyway, yeah. right? Well, it, I love, I don't know if you've seen Love on the Spectrum. I love that show. Yes. Um, my, my daughters and I have watched that and it's been really good for them too there's a lot of really good modeling that they go through as far like, as like hey when ask when you meet a person yeah and ask this kind of question and be open ended don't just a yes no question but give them a chance to respond and then you respond to what they said and so yeah it's just such a that's such a neat show so as you're talking about that article and this best practice targeting that population so many things you could learn just watching that show about you know, how, how to coach and, and guide yeah. them toward engagement. And then it's so neat and rewarding. So right. that, that's fun. So she talks a lot about, as you're thinking about serving this population, one really hard thing with accommodations and accessibility services is that we're asking a student to go and have a conversation with someone about what they need. And that in and of itself is very difficult for these students. Yeah. So figuring out yeah. how do we make even accessibility more accessible, right? Um, and then one more interesting thing about this article is that they were, there's a lot of discussion about for these students, whether they, whether an accommodation should be that they don't have to do group work in the classroom. And this professor was saying oh. that's really hard because so much of the college class is interactive. Um, plus your life, you are going to be in big group experiences in your life. So what would be better for these students is to give them a mentor and a coach who can then unpack the experience in the classroom to say what went well, what do you wish had yeah. gone differently? What can you do in the future? That is a really nice way to help them reflect on that experience instead of just saying, hey, we're going to make it so you don't have to do it. So I just love That's people good. who have expertise in whatever the population is um, to be able to craft the program to, to support them. The other article that I could, we could probably do a whole show on, but we're not going to, but we probably could. I mean, maybe we will in the future. Outside of um, Inside Higher Ed, the Invisible Student Majority. So this starts with a really long preamble, which I'm not going to go over, but it's basically like, hey, guys, our college students are changing. We have to start asking ourselves, what are we going to do for our commuter students? Some institutions are fully commuter. Some of them just have a population of commuter students. Fewer than 15% of undergraduates live on campus. That's amazing. Wow. That's like, so nationally, you think about, you have all of these commuters, you have upperclassmen who aren't living on campus. It's a huge population that we have to start considering and figure out how we're going to serve them well. So this article, whoever wrote it is an action item person, because there's like four pages <laughs> of action items to do about this. But a couple of things I want to call out of this, they're talking about a series of common problems that commuting students face. The very first one is transportation. And Matt, when I was telling you about this, I was just thinking the fact that a student has to get from place A to place B puts in the complexity of their existence, um, cost, traffic, parking, accidents, bottlenecks, weather, car maintenance, bus schedules, and alternative ways to meet 
to reach campus if your car isn't working, right? Just that one piece, like we're not even looking at the student as a whole right now. We're just saying the fact that you have to get from one place to another puts all of this complexity in that you have to be assessing uh, for a campus. Conflicting responsibilities is another one. Um, they have multiple identities. They have full-time jobs. They have a limited amount of time on campus, a lack of a sense of belonging. They say, <clears throat> they say that commuters often, it's like a filling station, like come and get what you need and then leave. There is no sense of belonging there. Um, and so they just go through and say, here are all of the ways that you can assess your environment to make sure that it's built for your commuters. They need to have services. They need to have an oasis there. Um, you need to be working with the city. I was thinking about Dr. Price in Chicago, right? Transportation for Dominican. How are students getting there and where are they parking and how can you partner with the city to make sure that you're assessing some of those transportation needs? Um, I also really love, they talk about for commuter students, how important it is for faculty to use in class time for things like having collaboration on group projects, for things like having special lectures, because that class time is something that the students are holding. Like they know from nine to 10, 20, they are supposed to be in class. So if you can use that time for some of these other things that normally you would say, hey, can you come in this afternoon? We're gonna have a lecture or, hey, you guys find some time to collaborate on your own. That is a huge service to your com commuter students. So. I really like that. There was one other one that I was going to tell you. Um, mm, oh, well, it's, <clears throat> yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I finish it up. Okay. Well, I was just going to say, one of the things that they say is so important for your commuter students is having your schedule for anything that they're going to do way far in advance, right? Because they're going to have to take off work or find somebody to support their family or take care of their kids while they're doing those things. So you don't want to do like, hey, last minute, we're going to have this get together. You need to tell them so that they have the flexibility to be able to, to manage that. So I think that's uh, some really great advice, but I would recommend you go look it up. It's called The Invisible Student Majority and it's on Inside Higher Ed. So awesome article. I just think it's so good to assess who who do we serve? What are some common needs? So yeah. we can't we can't solve all of those individual needs, most likely, but if we could just find like a common space, you know, we talk about that as a best practice. Yeah. I just I love the idea of of crafting an admiral's club kind of American Airlines kind of, you know, uh, club experience for commuter population and have all the things that they would need in that space that's there for them. Um, but to be really intentional about learning what these students need, what is your experience? What would make it better here? Why do you leave and come back? What would you need to be just make this your, um, you know, community during the day? Yeah, exactly. Okay, and the last one, you guys, I love some good professor snark. So this one's written by faculty. This is um, in the inquirer.com. It's called Higher Education's Biggest Scandal May Not Be What You Think. Uh, this faculty member in this article says, first of all, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, which is the um, group that assesses K through 12 educational achievements, basically for our students, they found that fourth and eighth graders showed significant dips in reading and math scores between 2019 and 2022. Uh, did I say that right? Yes. So then he goes on to say, how much learning did college students lose during the pandemic? He's a professor at Penn. Um, and the reflection is we don't know when we don't want to know. Um, right. He says that there's this, uh, especially at bigger universities, I think the universities we serve not as often, but there is sometimes at bigger universities, a emphasis on research. And that if you're a good teacher, you're somehow lesser than like, yeah, you can teach, but where's the research that you're producing, right? And so he's like, in some ways, there is an undervaluing of good faculty teachers, because we're putting so much emphasis on things like research and other things for uh, promotion. He says, um, basically, since COVID hit, our universities have not made any efforts to determine how well faculty were teaching when we went online or how much students were learning. Um, there is no national test in higher education like the National Assessment of Education Progress for K-12 schools to help us frame an answer for this. 
he says, um, since COVID, no major institution has made a full-scale commitment to determining how much or how little their students learn during the pandemic when so much of the instruction was online. And he's like, I've said this on my campus and many colleagues at Penn have told me that investigating instruction would be throwing good money after bad because you could never really evaluate the results of teaching scientifically. It's too idiosyncratic, it's too personal, to which he says, seriously, institutions like my own have generated vast knowledge about hundreds of hugely complex human behaviors ranging from stock market decisions to spousal choices. We could do the same thing for teaching if we wanted to, and we don't. So I just think it's such a good reflection, Matt. You know, we've been talking a lot this year about relationship-rich cultures, and the way you know that you value those is you are making it easy and incentivizing your faculty to be great teachers, great mentors connected in the classrooms. And so this vacuum of what our students are learning and how we measure teaching, I actually think a lot of our schools that we serve would be able to step in and fill that and say, we are going to start thinking about how do we assess learning and teaching on our campus, right? Because I it is a way to say this is valuable. So yeah. I do, I do love a little faculty smirk every once in a while. That is the state of the union. Okay. Thank you. So are you ready to talk about conduct? Let's, you, yeah, ready to absolutely. <laughs> okay. Are you? Well, I, I want, yeah, I want to start with this um, philosophy shift. So I want to talk about the philosophy of student deficit versus the philosophy of student development. And I want to lay that out because we talk about that a lot of times, but in today's conversation, the application of that is specifically to student conduct. Um, and then I want to go through this EPIC model and talk about it was developed at UTSA, uh, University of Texas, San Antonio and has had some really amazing results that you're gonna go over with us, Matt. So as we think about this philosophy of student deficit, um, we see this in a couple of other places where we've already had conversations about academic probation and academic early alert, and you will see the focus on a deficit model when you start listening to language. So, so many of you guys have done a great job at coming back to academic probation. We're going to rename it academic recovery. We're going to change the way we talk about it, the way we explain, explain it, right? The language. But in old school academic probation, we have, first of all, we're going to tell them about their failure. So they're on probation. Can we just start with that? They're on probation. They are red flag, they have a red flag, they're at risk, they're on warning, they've been flagged. This is all deficit model language, right? And then we're gonna tell them what to do in this academic uh, probation process. You're gonna meet with the probation counselor, which, what? It's you have a probation like a pro counselor? Parole board. Yeah, you know. yeah. So we're gonna, you have to meet with your probation counselor, you have to sign your contract, you have to show up to meetings, you have to log into the study hall and every element here, the language is documentation. This is not relational student development language. This is deficit. We need to document that you are doing the right things in order to be able to recover, right? Yeah. Um, we're going to tell them about their consequences in academic probation. So you can be suspended. You can be uh, expelled. You can appeal this decision very transactional, very you are at risk. Um, it's really interesting if we think about like conditionally admitted, we're basically like, we don't know about you. You're on probation. We're not sure you're going to be successful here. So let's wait and see what you do. If you document the right things and you have the right transactions, and then we'll be able to know whether or not you can be successful here. Terrible belonging cues sent in probation or conditionally admitted language. And then also remember we do in this kind of deficit model uh, academic probation, we do automatic alerts and emails to our students because we are putting the emphasis on a transactional exchange of knowledge. I am just trying to tell you when you miss your class, you are doing a terrible job. Are you aware of that? Yes, I'm aware of that. Okay, good. We're moving on. It's documented. We've had that exchange of information and we're going to move on, right? 
all of that we've talked about previously, you have to change that to the student development piece. But student conduct is very, very similar. In fact, with an added complexity, because we talk about it in a legal framework, right? So, so we're not only saying like, hey, you have to document and we have these transactions and you have to recover, but actually we were talking about it in a very legalistic way where our goal is to have a set of standards that everybody is going to follow. And then if you don't, we know then these are the consequences of that. And these are the consequences of that. And I don't know, Matt, you were saying something about like the legitimacy of the process. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Oh, well, I, I love, I mean, the word transactional is key in this, but there's also, yeah, I, when I think about it, it's like the lawyers got involved. And when lawyers get involved, then it is less relate relational, right? Right. Because we have to follow this and probably there, I mean, if you go back to, and you've done some research on the overall history of uh, judicial affairs and, and what, what that came out of, but it really was kind of a, we have to have a standard process so that there is legitimacy. There is a, a uh, operational guideline and the individual person is not being reviewed. Right, right. Because remember this came out of the civil rights movement where African-American students were getting dismissed from college, from a college in Alabama. The president was like, you can't go here anymore because you've been protesting. And the, the students sued the school and was like, hey, you're not allowed to just say we can't go here. And so the judicial system on a college campus was created to make sure that we have a process, a legitimate process to assess what students are doing, which is great, which we should have, but we've missed this then relational connection conversation piece because it actually came out of a court case uh, where they were like, you have to establish this process. So first of all, you guys, uh, this happens to me occasionally where we have this language like probation counselor, where they're I like revisit it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that's just the, what we call it. Judicial affairs is another one. I say judicial affairs all the time. And then in the context of this conversation, I'm like, what do we have judicial affairs on our campuses? Student conduct is a little bit um, better. This model talks about journey. So the epic journey that students are taking, which I just love that language way better than judicial affairs. Well, I think some lawyers who were working in higher ed wanted to tell their friends that they were doing judicial affairs, <laughs> not epic journey. You right, know what I mean? Right. Like, what is that? We don't so, even know. Oh, that. your law degree from UT. <laughs> what are you doing now? The epic journey. There it doesn't <laughs> ring quite but like judicial this, affairs. But this language, I mean, right. I'm doing judicial affairs. We have incidents. We have infractions. We give notice. We have investigations. We have hearings. We have findings. We have sanctions probation, suspension, appeal, all of that language is legalistic. And Matt, we have to be very careful because obviously there are things like Title IX issues that are coming up. There are significant issues that are, we do have a legal process that has to be applied to that. And I don't have any quarrel with that. Of course, that sure. is going to exist on our campus. But, you know, when I'm working with students or with uh, campuses, so we have a student conduct module that's called Pivot that was created really to support this process that I'm about to tell you about. And when I'm working with schools on that, they're like, Rachel, there's like two sides to this student conduct. There's like alcohol infractions and making a lot of noise in the res hall. And there are those things. And then there are these other things that are title nine issues that really, like we had to call the police and things happen. Right. And so what I find so often is that if you are using language, we were just on a campus that uses a uh, student conduct software for their early alert. And so faculty were going in and they have to say the, the software says, what was the incident? And the faculty member was reflecting like, no, there was no incident. I was just trying to say, I'm worried about the student. They're having a hard time adjusting. Even that language makes it so that we're distancing ourselves from seeing our students and putting them really at the center there, right? 
So I think so many times we would like to use a more relational language, um, but because of maybe some of the mechanisms, we are not able to do that. But you guys know language helps you understand what you are trying to accomplish and express to the other person the process that you are in. So that language audit of how you talk about student conduct, I think is super important. I think it's really important also on how you feel about a student who's in trouble or a student who did something they shouldn't have done. And so, you know, uh, well, Rachel, you introduced me to Chase Hughes. And uh, so he's a behavioralist. This is his his uh, six minute x-ray book, which is just about assessing people and reading body language. And, but one thing that just starting off that he made really clear, and it, it, for me, it resonates. It's like, there are four different ways that you look at a person. And, and when I think about, so this is all Chase Hughes stuff, but four ways you look at a person. When I think about, well, what do we wanna do in student development? And you apply these. So one is, they're broken. This is a broken student and we want to fix them. These are the ways that we're going to fix them. Which is deficit another is they're, for sure, right? Like that's the deficit. deficit. That's exactly yeah. right. The other is they're different. And, and actually when you see someone and they're different, um, they're, they're not like you reminds me of my grandfather saying of it takes all kinds. He, his thing was like, don't, don't mess with them. Like they're, they're not going to respond the way you would want them to. They're, they're, they approach it differently. Okay. Third is facts. Like this person does these things and that's who they are. That's, that's just a fact. I can't correct it. It can't be changed. It's a permanent thing about them. You know, they're, they're going to behave this way from now on. And then the fourth way that, that we look at people, the fourth way that people are looked at uh, is, is an understanding of reasons. The reason that person is behaving that way is because of something that they adapted to in their childhood. There are things that that led them to be this way. And also as a result, no one's perfect. And and that is so in, in this book, Chase makes it really clear, like you you want to get to that place where that's the way that you assess a person is, um, hey, they're doing these behaviors for reasons. We don't really understand all of them. But if we try, then we we can actually have a better connection with them and and maybe move them to a positive place. So yeah, for I don't sure. know. In counseling, we say everything makes sense in context, right? If you can understand why all of the things that are true about this person, then their behavior will make sense. They're they're not they don't act crazy. They act this way because of this context in which they. So are. I just think it's really important just the setup of that. Like the, so for our schools, the luxury of being able to take time to connect and understand and put things in context, that's really, really powerful. So I think that's why, why I love our conversation today around the epic journey, because it is, it is taking time to surround that student with people who can help them understand those reasons why they're doing things and ways to start thinking differently about their behavior. Yeah, so we're moving on to the philosophy of student development, which is really about student success is related to how we move a student in a process through self-understanding, connecting to our communities, right, personal development. All those elements are tied to the student development piece. And we're always talking about a student-centric model. So the idea with student conduct and this EPIC model is that there is a student at the center and they have an element of them that is being managed under this conduct piece, but it is not the student. That is what we are trying to address is whole development of the student, understanding that they have academic things going on, they have conduct things going on, they have things happening in the res life. All of those elements are working together. And so we're not defining them just as this conduct case, which is one of the things that I think, um, again, when I work with schools, the reflection of the student at the center so that I can understand the context of what's happening with them as I'm doing conduct work just gives me so many more tools than I have this isolated picture of all I'm doing with the student is conduct. And I have no idea what they're doing in any other area or how they're being connected with 
in our community, right? So I really like that as just a piece with our student at the center, I think is, is incredibly important. Um, okay, so I'm going to explain the EPIC journey model to you. I just want to remind you guys, though, we talked a couple of weeks ago about mentoring, and you remember that a really important piece of mentoring was, first of all, just-in-time mentoring, that it doesn't have to be like a huge relationship where over six years you're mentoring. It's like the person who is in front of you, the student who is in front of you right now, can you be present with them and can you mentor them? And so if your work is student conduct, the times that you're going to have a student in front of you most often are going to be in this process. And so we need to think about that in this mentorship piece. And you remember also coming out of that uh, relationship rich book, they said mentoring is incredibly powerful in the low moments because you're vulnerable, you're off balance, you're eager for somebody to give you unconditional positive regard. And so student conduct in that way is very, very um, rich ground for us to be able to do mentoring for our students because they're going to be vulnerable. Yeah. Okay, so the EPIC journey, this is a NASPA awarded um, process that came out of, like I said, the University of uh, Texas, San Antonio. Basically what they're doing through uh, motivational interviewing which we're going to talk about next week. I was going to try to fit it in this episode, but we it's too much. So I'm going to talk about that next week and how you can use that to, to connect with your students. But basically in this model, you have active sanctions and you have inactive sanctions. Active sanctions are a process that you're doing. Like you are required to do these things and experience them. And I'll unpack that a little bit more. And then you have inactive sanctions, which is just like the fact of where you are. Like you are on probation right now, or you are, you, you have lost a privilege. So the power of this model is that those two things work together. We have this hard edge of consequences for behavior and we have this soft edge of relationship informed discussions and actions that then are going to move a student forward in that development process. So in this model, EPIC, those are the four factors that we're looking at to try to understand why a student is making the behavioral choices that they are making. So I want to use alcohol infraction as an example of this, just to kind of as a use case for us to go through these. So EPIC. E starts for, or stands for engagement, which is we are looking and actually assessing on a scale how a student is involved in extracurricular life and how they understand the significance of that involvement. So you think about a student who has an alcohol infraction and you're doing this assessment and you're like, oh, they don't know how to get connected. They think the way to get connected is to bring alcohol to the party and so that then everyone's going to be their friend. So your assessment of their engagement in extracurricular curricular life would be, wow, it's not authentic. You don't have real friendships and authentic exchanges. You're using alcohol as a way to synthesize that. We need to do some student development around that, right? So in that engagement piece, you would be saying, we've got to figure out some things to do to help you grow in that way. The next one is personal uh, development. So engagement, personal development. Personal development is about how you manage your emotions, how you articulate your values and your goals, and how you ex uh, access support systems. So again, we have a student who has an alcohol infraction. What's going on with you? I'm having this conversation. I'm trying to understand why are you drinking alcohol when you shouldn't be? oh, you're very sad. Something is going on in your life where you feel overwhelmed and you're not, you don't have the tools that you need to manage your emotions. That is a completely different conversation than the person who is using alcohol to, to have some sort of connection with their peers, right? right? So we would be looking at the student. You guys remember our belonging cues, energy around the exchange, individualization, um, and future conversations. But the individualization is where we're like, help me understand what's going on with you. Not, I know all about you. So this is what we're going to do for your sanctions. This is what the, the process for everybody moving forward is, right? Okay, epic. So engagement, personal development, interpersonal development. This is where you're assessing for the student accurate interpretations of others, their behaviors, their cultures, their needs. 
as well as balancing their personal choices in order to achieve healthy, respectful interactions and relationships. So again, we have somebody who alcohol infraction and they are drinking in their room and inviting people over while their roommate is there and their roommate is feeling uncomfortable. We would be assessing then in this interpersonal development, are you not thinking about how this is uh, impacting your roommate and what it feels like for you to be drinking and drunk in their presence? Are you not considering their feelings? Okay, well, then we need to help you grow in that way. Yeah. So we would have a measurement um, on that piece. And then the last one is community membership. So recognition and awareness with one or more communities, identifying your roles in your communities and grasping your impact, um, the, the choices you make have on upholding our community goals and values. So you came to the school, here are the rules that we set forth when you continually choose to do these things, that is an infraction and here's how it impacts your community. So again, that's going to be a really different conversation than somebody who's sad and has an alcohol infraction or is using it to leverage like popularity and relationships, right? So what's really powerful is it's not a cookie cutter approach to uh, judicial affairs or <laughs> right. How, how are we going yeah. to correct the situation? This isn't cookie cutter, we're actually going to go through and in a, on a scale of one to 10, we're going to assess the student in each of these areas because all four are important for them to grow. And, and so I, I love that. And as we were talking about it, I was just applying it to love on the spectrum. All four of these things is what they work on really like, Hey, we need to make sure that they have engagement. They understand personal development, but interpersonal development. And also their role in community. It's super powerful. What I think is really neat is to, so we can think of the students who, well, there's right now in the news, a, the uh, story about a, a, a University of Kentucky student who, man, really needs to, to be assessed on these things because a lot of deficiencies, right? Um, but if we start looking at this student as a whole person, what are the things that need to be invested in? that would make them a better part of society and our learning community. Yeah. So then you take the assessment of these different elements and you say, we are going to create active sanctions, which are reflective. So I want you to reflect on something experiential. I want you to go experience something. They are really purposeful. They are crafted in order to move a student through the student development process in one of these four areas. Um, and they're sequential. We would say, first, we want you to do this thing. Then we want you to do this thing. And then next, we want you to do this, right? So we would use that to actually cr uh, craft those um, sanctions. And those are outcome focused. So we would want to say, um, you have this infraction. I want you to have alcohol education class. I want you to you know, go to counseling. I want you to volunteer in this place. And then I want to hear how that's changed your experience or what you've learned from those different pieces, right? Um, okay, so we pair that then with what they call inactive sanctions, which are disciplinary. Usually it's a loss of some kind of privilege. You can't live in the res hall. You can't, you know, join a social club. At sometimes it's suspension, right? Sometimes it means you have to go home. You, you have lost the privilege to stay with us. This is basically your inactive sanction is like a, a state of being for a student. This is just like the truth about where you are right now in the process. And they talk a lot about this marriage of the two. Um, and Matt, I think it's so important to say, you know, people fall, people fall somewhere along the spectrum on this where it's like grace for everybody, no rules, whatever you want. Like we just are gonna, okay, we can't do that because we do live in a community and there are impacts to our community when you behave badly, right? And then yeah. on the other side, man, I have worked with some judicial people who just love the rules, just like wanna drop the hammer every chance that they get on students, right? And it just doesn't make sense. Like, like- for, I'm thinking of one in particular where it's like, you know, the majority of your students coming in struggle with this. Right. When you're dropping the hammer, 
and and not addressing this uh like i said like chase points out like what are the reasons what what are they bringing that we have to overcome it's not it's not that they're wanting to ruin community and right. get kicked out they're they're coming with a a lot of issues context it's i mean right context. it's a lot of context for you to be able to yeah. say oh okay i see now why you might be doing those things um, so here's a example of a student who's, again, this is another good word, adjudicated for underage drinking, right? Here's our, here's our serious language. Um, during the interview, the student reveals she's from a small town struggling to fit in at a large ur urban university. She's ambivalent about consuming alcohol, but also thought it might be a good way for her to meet people. Her journey, which is what they call the active sanctions and the inactive sanctions. So her journey would include the inactive sanction of disciplinary probation, which is a consistent sanction for first time alcohol consumption. Her active sanctions would include alcohol education, a reflective experience designed to deepen her understanding of choices um, and other experiences designed to explore campus involvement and engagement in the university. So you've got to go to three meetings or we're having like a, a student uh, clubs fair. You have to go to it and talk to two people, right? That would be an example of the journey that is then crafted for that student um, to be able to move forward. So, so Rachel, and I know that you said we'll talk about motivational interviewing, but in that process, that's where that would come out. You're, you just keep asking the, okay, well, let, let me understand. What, so you're from a small town, you're feeling anxiety about, about fitting in. Why alcohol? Why did you, why are you picking that? Right? Yeah. I mean, it's just unconditional positive regard. Help me understand the context for why this seemed like a good idea to you. What's hard? What are your struggles? Then how can we address it? And what I like about that is, as you've always talked about this catalog of interventions, then we're able to then, oh, based on this, this is the right thing to add to your right. active sanctions. Right. You're still so in trouble. You still yeah, broke the every, rules and we're going to treat you that way, but we want you to recover, right? But this journey is one that we're going to go on together. I also really love he, um, in this article, they talk about the return journeys, which, oh my gosh, let's talk about future language. So you have a student who has a bunch of infractions and they have to be suspended. They're going to have to go home for a semester. But before they leave, you talk about here is your return journey to our campus, right? Mm -hmm. And while you're apart from us, yes, you are suspended, but here are the active sanctions we want you to walk through so that at the end of the summer, you can come back and be with us. And that future individualized energetic language that you're giving the student is sending the belonging cue. We want you back. We've already planned your return journey. Here's what you need to do in order to do that. So I just, I think that language is really beautiful for a student. And in, for some cultures, really important that they're not going back home and and with this shame of I, I was kicked sure. out I was suspended if you if you serve a population where that would be there, there would be a high sensitivity to that um then then just being thoughtful about how do we communicate in a way that the the family or tribe would know this this student is is on a journey and a process and they're welcomed back uh, next semester. I mean, I think to be able to go home and say, hey, yes, the school said I'm suspended, but here's what they've planned for my return journey. That is totally different than I'm suspended and they'll see if they let me in, right? Like maybe I'll come right. back. Like we've already talked about it. They're planning my return journey already and here's what it's going to look like. Yeah. I just right. think it, it totally changes the context of that. So I really love it. Um, okay. You guys practically so let me tell you what this process looks like uh, in a really practical way. They talk about a um, ep the EPIC spectrum scale, which is one to 10. So through motivational interviewing, when you're talking to the student, you are assessing on each of those four factors, engagement, interpersonal development, those four factors, where do they fall on the scale of one to 10? And so one really important thing about this is you have to have the right training so that people can recognize Here's what good engagement looks like. Here's what it sounds like. Here's the behaviorally what it's like. 
Um, here's what good interpersonal skills look like. And so that sort of operationally defining that and then giving that language to your practitioners to be able to recognize it is the, the first step there. Then you have to have some consistency in how you're assessing those different things. So like I said, this is what you are looking for when you are looking for a student who has good emotional uh, control or interpersonal relationships. Um, and there's a lot of training that goes into that in this model. So uh, they do training of practitioners and then throughout the year, they're like, hey, let's just make sure we're being consistent. This is what this language looks like. These are what these definitions are. These are what our standards are because in a model where you're talking about relational elements, you also have to have fairness and transparency about um, what, what do we say? Like in advising, it's like sometimes that's uneven application. Like you have this advisor who does this, and then you have this advisor who does this. And so in this model, you want to make sure that you have even application of the active in and inactive sanctions so that everybody feels like it's a, it's a fair and transparent process. So that training is really important. Um, then, sorry, is there more you want to say about that? No, keep going. Keep going. Okay. So then in this model, you also are having your journey team meetings, which I think is a great name for these meetings. And that is about when you are sitting down, just like we recommend you do in your holistic early alert, your care team meetings, when you um, are saying, okay, what's going on? What progress are students making in their journeys? Where are we stuck? What do we need to recycle? Come back and say, hey, that one's not working so well. Um, how are we going to manage that process and how do we um, use all of our team in order to support that? So that's super helpful. And then the last piece is you have volunteer mentors. This, Matt, I think is a great model for mentoring. They have models that they train um, where they're saying models, mentors, mentors. That they train where they volunteered and they've said, okay, come in, you're going to be able to, to uh, mentor students, but they only meet with students once. They're they only have to meet with students once. And then after the student meets with that mentor, um, the student decides if they ever want to meet with them again. So it's really, I think a nice way for a student to say there was a connection there. I felt like you were helpful. I felt like you did have unconditional positive regard for me, or you said something that really, you know, moved me along in my student development journey, or that didn't work great for me. I don't want to have to do that. That's that student's personal choice to be able to say, here's what I would like to do. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's such a helpful way to, to deploy mentors. Um, okay. Anything well, you to that practically? Well, related to that is is that they actually ask anyone on campus, "Hey, is there is there a uh, role that you'd like to have in the Epic? Can we add you and your expertise to the catalog of interventions? So, if we have a student uh, who's in a situation, what kind of situation would you want to be helpful um, in in helping guide a student or?" How would you like to participate in the EPIC journey with your students? Yeah, we were just talking about like whatever the work is, whatever you do in your office, what are places where you would say, wow, if a student ha was struggling with engagement on campus or interpersonal skills or, right, this would be a really great experience for them to have. I, I just love that idea of thinking through what your office, how your office might be able to be involved. So I see Megan's asking a question about holding people accountable for actions and behaviors in this model to help people who are hurt by the student to feel supported and safe. So let me break that down. I think there's a couple of things that I would say about that. First of all, obviously, as we said at the beginning, the separation of Title IX kind of issues, legal issues that are that are that have been elevated and escalated in a much higher manner. That is a different um, stream than what we're talking about. So there's a lot to be said about that, but I want to kind of separate that out from this uh, different level of infraction. Okay. So let me say that first. Secondly, I really like if we think about things like interpersonal development and community membership, 
I think we need to be very careful of people who have been hurt or who feel unsafe about somebody's bad behavior in our community. But the community should then be holding that person accountable to say, you did this to our community and to this person. And that's actually part of what you would be assessing and creating in these active sanctions. So it doesn't have to be a one-on-one, -on -one, like you did this to me and now I have to hold you accountable. But actually, how are we? how is the community gonna say to somebody who made somebody else feel unsafe or did something you know that that was inappropriate? How then do we have our community say, that's not how we treat each other. I've assessed you in this community membership. You aren't part of our community. You aren't uh, actively engaged with us. You don't grasp the way that your choices have an impact on our people. And so we are going to have to do some student development work on you so that you can come to a better place. So I think it's a really important um, point to say we're going to hold that person accountable and at the same time have safe space for somebody who is like, I shouldn't have to be involved in holding this person accountable. The community should be doing it. Matt, anything you want to add to that? No, well, I just think there's a whole lot more to unpack maybe maybe sure. next week or when we, when we cover the second half um, on that, because that's really important. The person who feels, um, the person who experienced the the victimization there or you know um there's a whole lot where they need to feel like they belong in this community um that that needs to be restored as well and they're protected yeah protected and safe for sure um okay so i we can chat to you the link to this article that's coming out of the naspa journal that explains everything that we've just talked about if you're interested in diving into it more. The only way that I could find this article is behind at my university's um, library login. So you may have to do that if you wanna read the whole thing, but we can chat the link to you so that you can go in and find it. Um, I also wanna tell you that I came across an article from a student who was writing about this process. And I just, it was such a great reflection. The article started with kind of, here's what the Epic Journey model is and here's the approach to it. And then the student's reflection was, first of all, why can't we use this for academic issues? Which absolutely, like I have said from the beginning for academic recovery, you need to have a list of things that you can deploy for a student who's in academic recovery. It should not be that they all have to go to tutoring because if someone's mom was sick and they didn't do well, in the semester, tutoring is not going to solve that problem. So you would you could do the exact same thing where you have a list of active sanctions and inactive sanctions, and you're deploying those in the, the academic difficulty piece. Um, also, the student was like, why can't we do this for all students? If, if we're talking about intentional student development, why can't we have an interview with all of our freshmen and say, I'm going to assess you on these five fact or four factors and then we are going to come up with crafted experiences for you so that you can learn and move through the student development model. So Matt, you were saying it's true. It's expensive. It's time intensive. There's a lot of training. There's a lot of work that goes into consistency. Um, so maybe you don't have the resources to be able to do it for every student, but there are pockets of students on your campus who would be well suited to have this kind of crafted experience um, to move them through uh, the, the process of student development, right? I think it goes back to right at the beginning, just talking about your special population, uh, a group on your campus that you could apply this to um, in, in, uh, in its own way, not just through conduct, um, yeah. but supporting that, that student population. So it's interesting just looking at with this, um, when they started the Epic Journey, the problem they were really trying to solve, they had 1,600 discipline cases every year. And when they looked at it, it was behavioral and academic uh, dishonesty. That that's where they started this, like, hey, when you're cheating in class, we need to talk about that. Um, let's understand that. And um, so I thought that was really interesting. but. But uh, the results of this are incredible. So they did a survey in 2010 trying to get feedback from um, those who went through the journey in each of their different areas. So if the student's epic journey was focused 
um, on, you know, so, so one was uh, for engagement. So all the students who went through the journey on engagement of the, and they had a pretty great uh, response rate, 585 students responded. And for those who did engagement, 87.3% strongly or agreed that they know more about getting involved on campus, which is a great outcome. Yeah. And 80, 88.4% said they had taken at least one step to get more involved on campus. Okay. So just right there that of this engagement, 88% are saying, yep, yeah, that was a helpful part of that. Uh, for personal development, this was huge. 92.6% agreed or strongly agreed that they have a plan to better match future actions and choices with their goals. And then for those on the interpersonal development, 83.7% agreed or strongly agreed that they have utilized one new strategy to improve their interactions with others. And then for community membership, 85.9% said they understand how their actions affect their community. So it's not like, you know, 30% of those who went through it said, yeah, I'm better off. It's strong 80s. Um, yeah. and, and so it's just a really neat model for how to improve a student, uh, a student's development on your campus. So the goals of this model are we want students to have a, a enhanced awareness of themselves, to be able to identify your support networks, recognize this as a personal journey. They're moving through these um, active sanctions. And then just to give them that active role in how they develop as a person. So next week, we're going to talk about motivational interviews. Um, and that's going to help explain kind of what that assessment process looks like and some really great tools that you can just keep in your back pocket for when you're talking to students. Um, but I am super excited about campuses that are thinking more holistically about our students. And this is, um, I think, going to just continue to build uh, as the time goes by, right? Keeping students at yeah. the center just never, you, you can't go wrong when you keep a student at the center. So thank you guys for joining us. Good to spend time with you. We'll see you next week.